Hello there, I'm Lee from Educative. Welcome to Educative Sessions. If you like this episode, please be sure to click the like button below wherever it may be. Also, don't forget to subscribe and get reminders on future content. Enjoy. Hello everyone and welcome to Educative Sessions, a podcast series with people in the developer world about their coding experiences. This is brought to you by Educative which makes it easy for authors to provide interactive and adaptive store um, courses, excuse me, for software developers. Uh, my name is Lingo and I am the host of Educative Sessions. My guest today is uh, Peter Voss, who wants to talk about the future of AI in your own home. Peter, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Really excited to have you. Uh, I, of course, uh, you know, I've been talking a lot about AI on our show and uh, liked, I think a lot of, a lot of our um, talks upcoming are on this subject. Um, but your background in particular and your vision for a lot of these things are fascinating to me. So let's start with your own background, Peter. Uh, you actually didn't begin in the space of AI or data science, as it's kind of called now. Uh, what was your own uh, entry point into the world of technology? Yeah, so I started out as an electronics engineer, so building hardware. And I started my own company developing microprocessor controlled equipment. And then I fell in love with software and, you know, programming chips, basically. And my company very rapidly turned into a software company. And um, I developed a comprehensive ERP software system and built quite a successful company around that. We did an IPO and that was awesome. And, um, you know, I, I just love programming. It's just in, in, incredible high. Mm -hmm. And, you know, segueing from programming into artificial intelligence, what uh, was that transition a lot like? Um, and how did you how do you come to define uh, the point at which, you know, programming becomes properly um, artificial intelligence? Right. So when I exited my my software company, I had sort of enough time on my hands to say, well, what big project do I really want to tackle next? And and the thing that struck me is that software is really dumb. You know, it doesn't have any common sense. And if the programmer didn't think of something, it'll just crash or give you an error message or something. You know, it, it doesn't learn, it, you know, it doesn't think. Mm -hmm. And so that's what struck me. I mean, I was very proud of, my, of the software we developed, but it's still, you know, it, it wasn't, it didn't have intelligence. So I really wanted to understand what would, what it would take to have software be intelligent. So I took off five years to study intelligence and all related fields to it, uh, starting with philosophy, epistemology, you know, uh, like what is reality? How do we know anything? And right. then cognitive psychology, uh, what, is, what is intelligence? How do we measure it? How does our intelligence differ from animal intelligence? And, you know, how do children learn and, and all of that? that kind of stuff. And of course, to uh, figure out what other people to learn what other people had already um, developed and thought about in, you know, the field is called AI artificial intelligence. So I took five years doing that. And during that period, I, I really came up with a, a design for a thinking machine. And it also made me understand very well how the field of AI had really gone uh, awry. That's uh, enthralling, I will say, and, and it's it's. I think what's most inspiring for someone like me who, uh, you know, I, I studied in graduate school, but my uh, knowledge base has largely been in critical thinking and anthropology, and um, and some philosophy and some a um, lot of like French and German scholars will put it that way, mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of cool to hear how potentially a lot of that knowledge speaks very closely to the work of AI. Hopefully, right. Um, can you share a little bit more about, you know, I'm, I'm, of course, asked a little bit more about what AI is, but it might be more helpful to talk about what isn't AI or what makes it very distinct when you're getting through the space of machines that are acting intelligently, right? Yes. Um, well, one of the sort of tragedies in my mind is that almost everybody working in the field of AI today uh, doesn't actually hasn't bothered to try and understand what intelligence is. <laughs> and uh, I don't know why I found that funny, but that please elaborate if you can. Well, it, it you know, it is funny. It is sad. 
Um, so when you go back to when the original term AI was coined some 60 odd years ago, it was about building thinking machines, machine that, machines that can think and learn and reason the way humans do. And it, it assumed, you know, that, that would be human type, human level intelligence. Uh, they also thought they could do this in a few years, but, you know, it turned out to be much, much harder than uh, originally thought. So what happened over the decades is people really drifted away from trying to build thinking machines and said, let's try and solve just individual problems. And basically AI turned into narrow AI, but it's a very, very different animal. So for example, a, a perfect example here is um, uh, Deep Blue, the, the world chess champion. And you know, it's basically let's solve the problem of chess. And if we can build a machine that can play chess well, then you know maybe we have an intelligent machine. But that's not the case at all. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, what happens there with narrow AI is you pick one particular problem, and then you have some very smart people figure out how they can program a computer to solve that problem most efficiently. But it's really the intelligence of the programmer that is being turned into code to solve that particular problem. So they, the intelligence resides in the, in the programmer or the data scientist today mm -hmm. and not in the program itself, the, the, the general intelligence, the intelligence to figure out how to you know, play a good game of chess. And we've basically been in the realm of narrow AI for the last few decades. And this is what's happening today as well. You know, if you, the Go uh, world champion that AlphaGo, that DeepMind built a, a few years ago, again, it's the it's a intelligence of the, the data scientist and the, um, the programmer that figured out how to basically use the massive computing power that they now have to actually play a good game of, of, of Go. And so I realized that uh, when I did my studies that, Basically, AI had really turned away from solving the problem of intelligence. And so in 2001, I got together with some other like-minded people, and mm -hmm. we wrote a book on the topic. And to revive the original um, dream of, of AI, we came up with a new name, and we called it Artificial General Intelligence, or AGI. So I coined that term together with two other people in 2001 or 2002. And um, it, it's really bringing us back to the, to the idea of building a, a thinking machine, a machine that can figure out how to solve a very wide range of, of, of problems, rather than the program or the data scientist figuring out how to solve that particular problem. And that's what I've been working on for the last 20 years. Got it. Yeah. I, I, I would ask you to elaborate more on, you know, of course, the insertion of general and what it speaks to. Uh, uh, in terms of the kinds of things that you and your colleagues are working on. Um, and, you know, is the distinction about, you know, when it comes to, you know, the examples of chess where um, the problems might not even be apparent, right? Uh, where does it require for, you know, that with this phrase that we use in, in very colloquial sense, like figuring it out, um, is the ambition for a machine to be able to figure it out right to not have to be prompted or not have to be directed in a certain way in order for it to use you know the logics that i'd say maybe basic programmers are familiar with to get to that conclusion uh what do you i guess in short mean by um artificial general intelligence what is what is i mean do i hope i have it but what is that general part yeah, it's exactly as you described. Now, there is actually another wrinkle to that. In uh, cognitive psychology, you use uh, uh, um, G, little g, lowercase g, to denote a measure of IQ or general intelligence. Now, uh, you know, they, it's got on a rabbit hole in terms of how meaningful IQ tests are. And I actually spent the better part of a year um, co-developing or helping to develop a, a new type of intelligence test that doesn't have the cultural bias that most IQ tests have. So there, there definitely is a, um, a sort of an IQ element to intelligence, levels of intelligence, basically how, you know, to what degree you can solve difficult problems, how quickly you can solve them and, you know, you get stumped uh, at what 
level do you get stumped? So there, there is a, a measure, and this would be across a very wide spectrum of, of different problems that some people are just a lot better at that than others. So that's where this little little G, so a G I has partially that, that kind of, of, of meaning, um, you know, the degree of IQ uh, of, of general intelligence, uh, human-like intelligence, but it's not necessarily tied to that because, you know, computer intelligence will inherently be different. Uh, I mean, computers are already much, much better at difficult math, math problems, you know, at multiplying big numbers or dividing big numbers or whatever than, than humans are. So in some ways, computers are inherently smarter, but in other ways, they, they kind of struggle. Mm -hmm. um, or it's much harder to get them to do things that are very easy for humans to do, mm -hmm. uh, or even animals to do. So the, but the, so the G stands in part for uh, this IQ bit, but it also just more generally denotes the ability to solve a very wide range of problems. And as you said, to figure out how to solve the problem um, by itself, you know, a, a thinking, learning machine, a machine that can think and reason and, and learn. Um, that's really what we mean by AGI. And that's really what was meant originally by the term of AI. Got it. And, and that's very helpful. Thank you so much for that. Uh, you know, at the same time, I wonder, uh, uh, aside from these codifiers to make these distinctions, I, um, is this is is it a quixotic goal? What it could say when it comes to, yeah, computers can do these amazing things that we can't, and humans can do amazing things that computers can't. Um, is the general pursuit to close that gap, or is there perhaps even an acknowledgement that like that gap exists for reasons, and therefore perhaps there's a different ambition of like how do we have these technologies complement each other more or what are ways that AI can enable humanity or, you know, I mean, it's a rarely ever question I'm asking. I'm just going to ask boldly now. It's like, how is it that perhaps uh, humanity can adapt itself to be able to be, to use AI more properly, one could say. Right. So first of all, in terms of um, any human labor that we can think of, you know, whether it's running a company or building houses or, or whatever it might be, um, there really is no reason why AIs couldn't get to the point where they can do that as well and in fact better than humans because they wouldn't have a lot of the distractions of, of humans and the failings of, of, of humans. Um, you know, they wouldn't make the same kind of mistakes or lose motivation or whatever, run out of energy, be distracted, you know. Um, so uh, un undoubtedly in my mind, we could get to that point. Now, uh, people are obviously nervous about that, but if you turn that around and say, you know, ask people, would you like to win the lottery? And most people would say, oh, yeah, hell yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to win the lottery. Well, what would you do? Oh, I, you know, I would obviously quit my job and I would do things that I really want to do you know, which is whatever, traveling, learning, you know, what, whatever it might be that they want to do. Now, whether they will actually cope with that leisure uh, psychologically is, is, is obviously another question, you know, uh, often, unfortunately, people don't know how to, to cope with sudden wealth. But leaving, leaving that aside, I think it's what really most people would want is to, to not have to work and to have lots of lots of money and to be able to do the things they want to do. And that's really the, the, the future we're talking about when AIs can do all of the, the jobs that people are currently doing. You know, I just read the other day that only 15% of, of people actually enjoy their work. Hmm. Uh, now, I don't know what that number is. And obviously it's to a degree and, you know, today you might enjoy it, tomorrow you, you, you hate it. Mm -hmm. But it, it's probably about right, you know, that 85% of people as it is would, would choose not to work right, right. If, if, if they had that choice. So that's the kind of future I'm seeing with AI. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, will there be major disruptions when we get to, get to that in terms of you know, people that grow up where perhaps their, their career is their identity? Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. But again, AIs will be able to help us help guide us like good psychologists can to help us how can we optimize our lives without going to work every day mm -hmm. 
Oh, there's a lot to say here. Um, the the one big thing it's it's I, I I want to share in your idealism. Forgive me, I'm generally quite skeptical. <laughs> Based on I, I maybe it's just a certain empirical uh, reality that I access, uh, but I do get quite anxious uh, even as you framed it. Um, and I mean, I'm trying not to cite certain nerdy literature, but uh, if the primary focus of a lot of AI development is in the sort of displacement alleviation of human labor, right? Um, it, you know, for, for better or for worse, it does seem to guide a certain kind of human evolution in a certain way where, um, you know, if we are, uh, for example, only left with the jobs that we want to do and what is work, what is essentially the things that we don't want to do but we'll do but for pay becomes displaced by AI. Um, I have this fear that it turns humanity into um, a society that will only act with like hedonism or self-indulgence or personal gain in mind or pure pleasure in mind or something like that. Um, that's, that's that's disconcerting and it makes me think a lot about uh, that. But that's that's now we're getting into like the realm of like uh, dystopian futurism. Um, I guess I'm much more interested in uh, you know the kinds of technologies that maybe will. Uh, like that, that think differently, perhaps, or that are um, interested in things that are forth, let's say, not just a betterment in like alleviating stress and pain and work from humanity, but also um, doing things that are at the, at the, in the end of it all, um, inarguably or like for the most part beneficial for society. Um, mm. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to, resolve a question and all that, but I'll start with, um, can you, you know, think of some examples of uh, maybe technology that is actually doing good, that is certainly AI driven and, um, and it maybe like gets away from this dystopian vision? Well, uh, absolutely. I mean, first of all, there are a lot of jobs that people really don't want to do. Now you can say, should there be a universal basic income, you know, for people who maybe you know, don't have the education to do a more challenging work or whatever the, the, the reason might might be. Um, but there clearly are a lot of jobs that really people don't want to do, you know, whether it's cleaning houses or, um, you know, working as a barista or whatever. I mean, a lot of people probably would prefer not to do those jobs. Or the area that we are very much involved with are call centers. Uh, really, it's not a, it's very few people make that as a career to have, you know, eight hours a day, people screaming at you because, you know, their modem isn't working or something wasn't delivered on time or, or, or whatever. It's not really a job that people, many people want to do. Um, certainly not the sort of low level routine things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those are things we, we are working, working on, um, Quite frankly, call centers have a, a really hard time finding people, uh, you know, attracting people to to do those jobs for good reason, and they don't tend to last because you get burnout. So automating that seems to be a, a real win all around. Um, but l let me let me get talk about something more challenging. We have so many problems that are facing humanity, you know, whether you're talking about a disease or um, you know, climate, climate issues or pollution, you know, energy, um, governance, of course, is a huge one as well. How do we run our society? Uh, seems to be the worst people get to the top and, you know, not the best people. So I, I, there, there are lots of things, but one, one area in particular, and that is scientific research. Uh, if you take, for example, how many decades have we been fighting cancer now, just to take one one disease, you know, the, the war on cancer, been around for what, 40 years, 50 years. Um, if we had PhD level AI researchers that we could train up on the, the core technology and then copy a million times, and we'd have a million PhD level uh, cancer researchers chipping away 24 seven, mm -hmm. Uh, without the egos getting in the way, they would be communicating with each other, supporting, helping each other, you know, uh, and they'd, they'd have photographic memory. 
be much better at, at reasoning about things, having you know, logical reasoning, that have instantaneous access to everything on the internet by virtue of being a computer. The progress we could make in, uh, in medical research, uh, we'll talk about the pandemic now, uh, would be just phenomenal. I mean, it, it's interesting that it's framed that way, right? And even the, the you know, I, I certainly would agree that uh, we could stand to have a lot more of an intelligentsia of more like, certainly like apolitical aligned, like productively discoursed academics, right? But it also speaks to the fact that right now, I mean, if, if in creating AI, we have the ability to create multiple, multiple AI, right? Million AI that could arguably do the same thing. Um, but the presumption is that they can't. They they will not be able to supplant the um, the creative power, the improvisation, the um, the honestly the 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 ingenuity that's required to handle such a gigantic decision. I don't know if you'd agree with that, but uh, uh, no, I don't think there's any evidence uh, that AIs would not would would not have the ingenuity or the right. uh, creativity. Okay. Uh, I, I think all indications that there are. In fact, some of the narrow AI that's that's coming about now in creating art. Uh, oh, you know, yeah. This is still very early stages, but you know the the art is being created, and and whether you want to call it art or right. But, well, that's, that's that's the caveat, right? Yeah. But I, I'm, uh, I'm, um, I, I'm aware of this as well, and uh, yeah. it's certainly. I think almost we're in conver this talk is in conversation with other talks we want to have on that topic mm. um and I, I i mean it's it's there's like a do you agree or disagree on this is i i think is moot um I, I do want to ask one question though um before we wrap soon which is regarding um you know like i think again i have my skepticism maybe it just comes from a certain mindset of uh this human fear of making AI too intelligent or approaching a point where um, it questions our own morality and AI's morality. But I believe there was a different concern that you might have. Um, you know, let's call it in the approach of the singularity or what have you, of this point where, um, you know, perhaps political things are are upended. Um, is there uh is there a problem maybe or is there some kind of issue in the near future that uh, we should be more attentive of as things are evolving the way they are so i i think uh my concern really is that ai is not intelligent enough a lot of the potential mistakes that we see for power, powerful ai uh, would be a lack of intelligence and not that they too intelligent that that would be would be my take, and um, so my, my 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 bigger concern is is really that humans may not be we may need AI to save us from ourselves. Mm. Uh, I think there are a lot of risks with humans running the running the world and and you know uh, coming up with solutions. Mm. Um, Perhaps it's always uh, been allegorical from the start, right? <laughs> yeah, but fair enough. So you know, you mentioned ethics. It's actually a, an area that I studied quite extensively, and I've written about um, ethics and morality quite a bit. Um, by the way, my articles are all on Medium.com. You can just search for Peter Voss on Medium.com. Um, and ethics really is sh should also be treated as a science. It shouldn't just be an emotional thing, you know, oh, this is right and this is wrong. Well, how do we know? Because we grew up in a certain environment that kind of gave us those biases, you know. Uh, how do we actually know what's right or wrong or what is good or bad? And it's, it's actually a rational question to ask. And a machine, an AI, a truly intelligent AI, AGI, um, would actually help us figure out um, what the right things are to optimize, what are the right, what's the right behavior, what are the right characteristics that are likely to foster um, a, a more optimal life, a flourishing, a human flourishing. Got it, got it. Um, I like that. I, I think I appreciate how, I mean, it's, it's, I'm still, I mean, this, 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 I need to go through some like, like cynical purge or something. But um, what I do like when talking to technologists such as yourself, um, 
it's like there's there's no panic. There's in fact, if anything, but just optimism. There's potential there. And um, what I've also appreciated in this discussion is that perhaps these problems that people freak out about in the future are merely problems that already exist in the present, but we're just trying to displace it onto something that um, is more, I guess, othered in a sense. So um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm perhaps... Yeah, they, they, I mean, there certainly are uh, quite a number of people, um, in fact, that make a living out of um, talking about the dangers and, you know, supposedly studying mitigations of the dangers of AI. Now, part of that is driven by just bad science fiction you know mm. i mean all the movies not saying a, I watch you know the all. ais are always the bad guys you know right. because it makes for a better movie you know mm. so there is that that sort of just background fear of of ais interestingly enough uh japanese culture doesn't have that they actually are very pro uh robots uh I, i'm not sure why that is you know what the historical uh difference difference is but uh clearly at western culture movies are always you know ai is always the bad guys and you know destroy the world mm -hmm. take over the world uh now that is quite irrational as i say it's just the way movies just de depicted now there is an an academic um sort of realm of of people who who are concerned about ai and the the big technical problem they talk about and without getting too technical i'll just uh, you know uh, talk about it briefly is they call it the alignment problem mm -hmm. and what they mean by that is what if the programmer gives the ai certain values and the ai doesn't really understand what you want it to do so you know for example for to give a crude example you could say uh, AI, your goal is to make me happy. And the AI basically just feeds you drugs, you know, and because it misunderstood what you mean by, by happy, you know. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think it's completely misguided, that, that type of research, um, because an AI that's smart enough to, to do this magic for you, that's like a genie in a bottle, you know, that can, that can really you know, achieve a lot of things would clearly be smart enough to also ask you, well, wh what do you actually mean? What would make you happy? And have you actually thought through that, you know, taking drugs uh, might make you feel good, you know, for a while, but, you know, we could, you can anticipate uh, the downsides of that. So I'm not concerned about the alignment problem. To me, it's a, it's a non-problem. If the, if the system is smart enough to to do these magical things, it'll be smart enough to understand what you want and what is actually good. And in fact, to guide you away from things that may not, that may be harmful to you in, in the long run. Got it. So, yeah, okay. yeah I, I, I hear that you're very nervous about this, this, this future. And I, I think a lot of people, uh, a lot of people are, mm. but um, we don't know how soon it's going to happen, but it's going to happen because there are there are so many forces driving AI development. You know, there's it, it's unstoppable. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, it's going to happen, and for mostly from my perspective, all for the good. I think we need we need more intelligence, not less. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, you know, my opinion almost doesn't matter if. The juggernaut is real, <laughs> but uh, but I do appreciate at the very least that uh, the way you framed it as um, this could be a particular. I mean, growing up in America myself, uh, like the antagonism is quite prominent in pop culture. Um, but I do know of the other examples that you cited where perhaps these explorations should be a little bit more with curiosity than judgment, and that there is a lot of interesting potential there. But whatever that line is, is quite far from like the, 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 the line where it becomes a potential danger is quite far from uh, uh, where like the technology is. Um, and I, I know I think it's almost as a gentle reminder that like humanity is already at that line of being a potential threat to one another. So um, 
a fun reminder as well. You know, I hope everyone listening to this will sleep well tonight. Um, but uh, Peter, um, this has been, I mean, I wish we could do this for another 30 minutes, um, but we do have a bit of a time crunch and maybe we'll do this again in the future. I want to give you an opportunity to do a shameless plug and to talk about the fantastic work you clearly are doing in this space and how people can learn a little bit more about you and uh, the thoughts that come out of your head. Yeah, the company I've been, um, uh, I founded um, about six years ago is called igo.ai. And what we do is basically we are building artificial general intelligence was with specific applications for conversational AI to, to have intelligent conversations. And one obvious area is a, a call center automation. And we call our product a chatbot with a brain. You know, normally when you have an automated chatbot, most of them really don't have a brain. You know, they don't remember what you said two minutes ago, never mind what you said last week. Uh, they don't really deeply understand you. It's just you going down a flow chart, you know, and, and uh, asking questions. So the technology that we've developed is it has a brain. It actually remembers what you said. It has a much deeper understanding. It can reason about what's going on. So it's a much more pleasant experience and a much more useful experience. So, you know, we have uh, banks and, and uh, one of our big customers is 1-800-Flowers where, you know, we have a concierge service that it remembers who you are, who you buy gifts for, what kind of gifts you buy and so on. So it uh, gives a much better experience. And it's very exciting to actually see the, the technology, you know, help people and and give a better experience and we we our plan is to continue increasing the iq that igo can be increasingly helpful in in different realms including research as i mentioned i think that's wonderful uh, as someone who actually i do prefer virtual assistants and i do prefer uh chatbots um oftentimes if they are sophisticated enough to get to the solution that's great um, but for fun, I actually will sometimes just ha talk, have, I like to have casual conversations with chatbots. Is that strange? I don't know. Um, <laughs> it, oh, you think so? Well, I mean, if you've designed it that way, then it's a totally cool thing, but who knows mm -hmm. what kind of problems I've not even realized about myself that I'm resolving through this technology. Um, well, you, you will love what we are working on, which we will hope to have available in a few years is what we call a personal, personal assistant. Oh and the reason we call it a personal, personal assistant actually should be personal, personal, personal assistant is there are three different meanings of personal mm -hmm. that apply. The first one is personal in terms of ownership. You own it. It's yours. It belongs to you, not some mega corporation that serves your agenda, not some mega corporation's agenda. So that's the first personal. The second personal is uh, uh, highly customized, personalized to you. It knows your preferences, you know, and, and how you operate and so on. So that's the hyper personalization. And the third meaning of personal is that is the privacy issue that you decide what it shares with whom. So that, that is what we'd like to provide to everyone is a personal, personal assistant that can help you, that do stuff for you, help you think things through. Mm -hmm. and, and you can have casual conversations. You can, you know, mm -hmm. have fun, fun with it, fun conversations with it. You know, what I'm finding fascinating is how much your work is clearly breaking down the complexities of just what people do for each other and, and mm -hmm. like, whether they're your assistant or your colleague or your friend, um, you know, there are many times where like, I sometimes think I work with this person, but I'm also their therapist. And, you know, mm -hmm. what, what these things mean, uh, like so much more when you break them down to its elements. And I, I, I find that's really, really like, mm -hmm. we've, we have to have you back on the show again to talk more. more yeah, I'll be, uh, be happy uh, to uh, talk. <laughs> absolutely. But for now, let's uh, definitely wrap up here. Um, Peter Voss, thank you so much for being on Educative Sessions. Uh, I feel like my mind has been suffici sufficiently blown. Um, and uh, at the same time, you know, I'm working to build up my intelligence to be that of uh, maybe your overlords, but probably much more of our colleagues in art artificial intelligence. So thank you so much. Um, and I also, also want to thank uh, you for listening or watching this episode on YouTube or on any major podcasting applications. Um, if also you're interested in learning a little bit more about artificial intelligence or just coding or what have you, you can check us out at educative.io. So for all of us here at Educative, thank you so much and 
Happy learning. Bye-bye now. Hello there, Lee here from Educative. Hope you enjoyed this latest episode with Educative Sessions. If you liked this episode, please click on the like button somewhere. You can find more episodes on YouTube or on any major podcasting app. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. It actually helps us a lot. Happy learning.